The Honor System The concept of honor that men began has been made to serve a feminine purpose. I have no doubt that the principle of honor dates back from as long ago as we can track human civilization. But like so many other social foundations men have instituted, the feminine will covertly position them to its own purpose. In the introduction to The Art of Seduction, author Robert Greene explains why there was an original need for seduction to be developed into an art. For this, we can look back to ancient civilizations where women were essentially a commodity. They had no overt external power to control their fates. But they excelled, and still do, at covert psychological internal power. And this, of course, finds a parallel in men and women's preferred communication methods. The feminine primary agency has always been sexuality and manipulating influence by its means. Much in the same way that each gender communicates, so too is their method of interacting within their own gender. As men, we're respected when we keep our word, sacrifice ourselves for a worthy cause, even to the point of disposability, solve problems rationally. Our word is our bond and a whole host of other qualifiers that make us respectable and worthy of integrity. We must be overt and above board, and when we encounter a man who is covert in his dealings, we call him shifty and think him untrustworthy. Even for the most noble of purposes, practicing the art of misdirection is not something men are respected for, at least not publicly. It's just this overt masculine interactive nature that women are only too ready to exploit. In combination with their sexual agency and influence, they use this overt male social interactive dynamic to position themselves in places where they can use indirect power. Cleopatra was an excellent example of this, sending armies to war by appealing to powerful men's pride and honor while reserving her sexuality as a reward. Virtually every feminine social convention is rooted in appealing to or attacking male social institutions a dedication to an idealistic sense of honor being chief among them. The obvious example is, of course, shaming and the do-the-right-thing social contract. In fact, to be a man has become synonymous with living up to a feminine imperative that's cleverly disguised as masculine honor. It's not that women created honor, but rather they've recreated it to serve their purpose. In the biblical Ten Commandments, we're told not to commit adultery. Don't sleep with another man's wife, which probably wasn't too hard to abide by when polygamy was the norm. In fact, multiple wives was a sign of affluence. It used to be the conspicuous consumption of the epoch. Why then is polygamy a social perversion now? What changes occurred that made polygamy honorable, even enviable, into a very evil taboo? Along with language and culture, social conditions evolve. What we think of as honorable today are the result of centuries molding. It's very easy to romanticize about times when honor among men reigned supreme and then lament the sad state of society today in comparison. But doing so is a fool's errand. Honor in and of itself is, and should be, a foundation for men, but it's only useful when we understand it in the perspective of how it can be used against us.